case management with a focus on trauma-informed care and harm reduction. Ms. Nesbitt worked for the National Abortion Federation in Washington, D.C., as well as Southwestern Women's o Options in Al Albuquerque. Um, she graduated with a BA in Anthropology from American University in 2014. Please give her a warm welcome. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna send around a sign-in sheet. Um, this is just to be used like for my grant reporting to see how many people are in attendance. So um, if you don't wanna put your email or phone, that's totally fine. Just yep, exactly. And ask your profession too. Um, so hi, thank you for sticking around at the, is there one more session after this? Okay, one more, all right, you guys almost made it. Um, so I'm gonna talk about supporting people with co-occurring disorders. So very, very specifically with brain injury, mental health or mental illnesses, and substance use disorders. Um, to be clear, I'm a brain injury person. That is my role, so it does have a brain injury bent, but we'll talk about mental health, substance use, and then how to support somebody that's dealing with all of those things. So if you have questions, feel free to, to jump in as we go. Um, so my name is Jess Nesbitt. I'm a case manager at the Brain Injury Association of Maryland. We do um, a lot of different things, but mostly we provide information and education to anybody that needs it. So we can answer a hotline um, where families or survivors call that are looking for support. Um, there is a traumatic brain injury waiver in Maryland, so I do case management for them. And then um, I also do health education, which is why I'm here. And I use she and her pronouns. Um, as you feel comfortable, I would always encourage you to share pron your pronouns with people so that our trans and non-binary um, friends and loved ones feel more comfortable um, sharing theirs as well. So let's just talk about what we'll go through today. Um, welcome, thank you for coming. I always like to say, remember you have a body. I think oftentimes in conference spaces, we are um, told to just be like very focused and only bring our brains to the table. So if you need to go to the bathroom, if you need to drink a water, if you need to stretch, please do what um, feels good. I'll go through a couple of quick questions and answers to get us um, you know, thinking out loud. Talk about brain injury and then brain injury mental, and mental health brain injury and substance use, co-occurring disorder, disorders, and then some accommodating strategies. I have um, up here, and I'm happy to bring these around to you, a really helpful pamphlet um, out of Ohio State that is called Accommodating the Symptoms of TBI. That is really helpful, especially if you're professionals, for things that you can do to help somebody, um, you know, if you're seeing them in therapy or, or what have you. Um, I also have my card and our brochures up here. So let's get started. So as I go through the questions, I'll read them out. I'll read out the answers. You can feel free to say what you think the answer is. So first of all, how much does the adult brain weigh? We have 1.5 pounds. Anybody? OK, no. Three pounds? A couple of you. Or five pounds? It is three pounds. It is tiny <laughs> and does so, so much for us. Um, all right, how many then, how many adults in the United States have both a mental health and a substance use disorder? 3.3 um, million people? And growing? Okay. We'll talk about that. What about 5 million people? Maybe. Okay. And then 8.4 million people. Correct. 8.4 million is the correct answer. So that's a lot of people that are dealing with two very difficult um, disorders or illnesses. Of those 8.4 million people, how many people do you think receive treatment for both conditions, for their mental illness or their mental health condition and their substance use disorder? 7.9%? Um, yeah, <laughs> all right, <laughs> you get it. Yeah, it's, the treatment is for both is very, very low. Um, often people are treated for the thing that is the most pressing, the most, um, the thing that is, um, like more of a crisis, right? But then there's other conditions that aren't treated um, along the way. So then how many people do you think in the United States are treated in emergency departments, hospitalized, or die as a result of a traumatic brain injury each year? The first answer is 231,840. Anybody? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, right. Uh, 2.8 million, anybody? Okay, or 1.2 million. All right, so it is 2.8 million. Um, and those are the people that we know of. So this is all the people that are seen right in emergency departments, but it doesn't account for the people that fall down and hit their head and don't ever go to the doctor um, or can't afford to, something like that. So that's a, a low estimate of what, what we see. Um, and mm -hmm. Yep, exactly, yep. So we're talking about that too. And I'll go into what brain injury is and looks like in a little bit here. Um, so because that is a huge question and it packs a lot in, I just wanted to break this down for you. Um, so each year of those 2.8 million, about 56,000 people do die. Um, 282,000 people are hospitalized, but the majority of people are treated and released from an emergency room. Um, we'll talk about that. So I apologize, this is a sort of a confusing question, but three of these people have had a traumatic brain injury and one of them hasn't. So who, I'm asking who you think has not had a traumatic brain injury. Um, has Tracy Morgan had an injury? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he was in a really bad car accident. Mm-hmm. Exactly. What about Ben Roethlisberger, the football player? He is, yeah, exactly. And you, you don't even have to think twice, right? You're, oh, okay, you know, he's a football player. He's probably had a brain injury. Yep. Exactly. And multiple. Um, and we're seeing now that the effects of multiple concussions are similar to a very severe injury. Um, they're cumulative. Mm -hmm. What about Anne Hathaway? No? Okay. What about George Clooney? Yep, he's fallen off his motorcycle. He um, fell from a set. He was filming, I think, Syriana. And <laughs> he um, was actually dealing with really severe depression after his, his fall um, and went to his dad. And his aunt had, had, a, um, had died of a brain aneurysm. And he said, this, you know, this actually sounds like something similar to what she was going to. And so I think you should get some help and support. Um, and he had a pretty severe injury. He was leaking cerebral spinal fluid from his nose. Um, but I, which is gross, sorry. <laughs> Should have clarified that up front. Um, but he is one person that I always like to bring up because a lot of people might look at him and think, no, he doesn't have a brain injury, right? He looks really good. Um, and I like to talk about that because most of the people that have brain injuries, you can't tell that they've had an injury, right? It's an internal injury. Um, so that's why, and I'll talk about this, why it's important to ask people if they've had an injury to screen um, and to factor that into to how you're working with someone or treating someone. Um, and we'll talk about that. So it's time to define the TBI, the traumatic brain injury or an acquired brain injury. So what is it? Um, so a traumatic brain injury, that's what you probably hear more of. You hear TBI a lot. Um, and that's, for whatever reason, just how we talk about it um, in this field and in general. But a TBI is an insult to the brain that's caused by an external physical force. So something from the outside is affecting my brain or causing an injury. So that might be a fall where I fall and I hit my head, car crashes, sports injuries, um, assaults. And then acquired brain injury is the umbrella, um, which TBI falls under. So acquired brain injury is an insult to the brain that occurs after birth and is often caused by internal factors, so that's medical conditions is how I think of it. Um, so a stroke or you're having a lack of... Mm -hmm. TIAs, exactly, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, good point. We'll talk about loss of consciousness, yeah. So there's a lot of different um, causes of brain injury. Um, and traumatic brain injury is an acquired brain injury, so this is another way of looking at it. You have an acquired brain injury, and then there's all these things that fall under it, and TBI is one of those things. Um, so common causes of brain injury, actually, 47% sports are one of them, but they're not the leading cause. It's actually falls, um, which we see in younger and older people are more likely to fall. Um, if somebody is struck by or gets something, that's a common cause. Then we have car crashes, um, assaults. Oh yeah, there's a lot of really bad accidents that have come out of not just vehicle accidents, but right the scooters that we're seeing a lot. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways people get injuries, certainly. Um, so the category that's unknown is 
when people are found down potentially, that somebody is called, uh, you know, the EMS is called and they might find, sorry, that they have like a brain bleed or some injury, but you don't know exactly what determined, what caused it in the first place. Um, and other are all the things that don't fit neatly into those other categories. Um, and then just briefly, I'll talk about severity levels, right? So with any injury or any condition, there's varying levels of severity. So most people who have traumatic brain injuries have mild traumatic brain injuries, which are also concussions. Um, and that is when people lose consciousness or have a change in consciousness for less than 30 minutes. Um, about 10 to 13% of people with traumatic brain injuries have moderate injuries, and then about 7 to 10% have more severe injuries. So if you have questions about that, we can talk about that more. Um, I'm sorry? Exactly, yep, so severe is what is more often referred to as coma or uh, a vegetative state. Um, so we also know that some people are more likely than others to get or sustain traumatic brain injuries. Um, I sort of mentioned this earlier, but children and older adults are more likely to sustain TBIs um, from falls, right? So kids that are just learning to walk fall a lot. That's part of how that, how that goes. I know my brother, oh, fell down the stairs all the time as a kid um, and probably hit his head a bit. And then older folks are more likely to sustain injuries because um, your balance starts to go. You might be on a lot of different medications um, that cause imbalance. You might have foot problems. Your vision might change, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm, exactly, yep, glaucoma. Um, people with lower income also are more likely to sustain tra traumatic brain injuries. Um, I usually ask, you know, why you think that might be, and have a little, some clues, but do you have thoughts of why, why people with less income might have more traumatic brain injuries? They don't have to get care. Sure, you can't afford care. Somebody doesn't go to get care or can't afford it, um, certainly. And you also have decreased access to, like, those preventative measures, so baby gates. Um, or I, the thing that I think of is, um, right, if I'm in a poor neighborhood and my taxes um, pay for a new playground, I might not have the money to put in like a really nice soft padding on the playground. So there's a lot of different ways that can look. Um, and then men are also twice as likely to sustain a traumatic brain injury. Any thoughts on why that would be? <laughs> exactly, yes. Right, absolutely. Risk takers, I think a piece of it too is men are more, um, likely to participate in those like high contact sports. Um, but yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely, mm -hmm. more extreme sports. Yep. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so for those of you who can't hear, um, she was just saying that men sort of do like that more, I guess more dangerous, right, housework, they're climbing up ladders. Um, one time I asked this question and somebody was like, well, I was out at the bar once and my husband was starting to argue with someone and he said, well, hold my beer. You know, so men also like are more likely to maybe get in fights. Um, that's a broad uh, generalization, but we do know that men are more likely to sustain traumatic brain injuries. Um, and then some groups also have multiple mild traumatic brain injuries. So athletes, I don't think that's so surprising to us anymore. We are starting to know that Athletes have multiple concussions. Um, and boxers, exactly. Boxers, um, football players. Mm -hmm. um, and then people who are homeless are more likely to have multiple mild traumatic brain injuries. People who have mental illnesses, people who use drugs, people who are incarcerated, and then victims of domestic violence or childhood abuse. So as you're seeing people, um, you know, if you're professionals, in your practices, you're probably seeing people that deal with a lot of these things. Um, and so that could be, you know, potentially a clue to talk to them about a traumatic brain injury um, and ask if they have had it. Yeah, there's a lot of really horrible stories, sure. Um, I'll talk really briefly about anatomy just because I'm gonna talk about how brain injury can affect you um, and what it might look like. But um, I'm not an expert. <laughs> In, in the brain. So this will just be the basics. Um, we see in brain injury, the two most common lobes of the brain that are affected are the frontal lobe, um, and then the, oops, sorry, the temporal lobe. 
Um, so the frontal lobe is responsible for a lot, a lot of things. It's responsible for our executive functioning skills. Um, does anyone have a guess or a definition of what executive functioning is? Mm -hmm. Yes, focus, organization, exactly. All the things that you, you sort of need to get by day to day. Um, yeah, your cognitive skills, your ability to problem solve, um, sort of come up with a plan B if there's an issue that comes up. Um, and a lot of organizational skills, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, so the frontal lobe, if there's damage to that, can also um, create problems with memory or language. Motivation is a big one that, that I see, is people after a more severe or moderate injury struggle to find motivation in the day. Um, and that's not like motivation to go back to school or something, it's like I'm struggling maybe to get up and complete the tasks that I need to do. Um, and that's tied um, in my mind to initiation too, people have trouble initiating or getting start, started. Um, so it's not that people are lazy, it's that there's something that has changed in their brain um, that affects these things. Um, so that's just sort of, there's an image up here of another umbrella and all the things that, um, that fall under executive functioning. So there's initiation, um, emotional control is a part of that, organizi sorry, organizing materials, planning and organizing, so things that are really important to us that we really take for granted. We sort of assume that we can plan and organize um, our day, and so it can be a real issue when, when people have an injury and that changes. We'll talk about that. Um, the temporal lobe is also what we see as a, um, another part of your brain that is affected um, most commonly, and that plays a role in emotions and sensations, um, also like understanding music, aggression, sexual behavior. Um, and it also contains the language area of the brain, and um, it is common after a traumatic brain injury or an acquired brain injury for there to be um, language problems, and I'll talk about that a bit. There are two other lobes of your brain. Um, the occipital lobe is responsible for vision, so often we'll see people that have change in vision, double vision, um, and then there's your parietal lobe too. But the frontal and the temporal are the ones that we see most affected. Um, so what effect can an injury have on someone? It can affect a lot of, um, of different things. For those of you, has anyone um, worked with a client that had a, had a traumatic brain injury? No? Has anybody, have you worked with anyone that's had a traumatic brain injury? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say that you know of is sort of the little asterisk I would put in there. Um, were there any like symptoms or problems that you saw as a result of that? Mm -hmm. Memory, sure, absolutely. Memory was a big thing, and then mood. So we okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I think that is a really good point. A lot of times um, after somebody has a brain injury, you do see it exacerbating um, problems that happened before. Um, I know my brother had an injury and he was, you know, pretty disorganized before and now it's, it's a lot more of a problem for him. And impulsiveness, that's what you've seen. Sure, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the middle. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
And that's common for perception to change and also um, what's called proprioception, so where you are in space, um, can be affected. So people might sort of run into things and think you know, they're a little further to the left. Um, but I'm also hearing you know, memory is something that you've seen with people. Um, just some general changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's it. And I've heard people um, you know, that call into our, our hotline say, I'm doing really well, but it's not where I was before. And so it's so frustrating to, to explain that to providers, because they look at you and think, you know, you're good. You're fine. Um, you don't have as many needs as somebody else might, and that can be dismissive. Um, so there's a lot of different ways a, a brain injury can look. Um, so everybody that has a brain injury is going to be different, right? Like just like our brains make us all a little bit different, um, every injury is different. So that means I'll, I'll go through some different um, suggestions, accommodations, things that you could do as you work with a client that you um, have identified having a traumatic brain injury, but it's, it has to be person-centered. It has to be based on what things that you've seen happen with that person or things that they know have worked. Um, sorry, so that's just a, a caveat. Um, this is a list of some things that, that you could see. So I mentioned a change or a loss of vision. Um, some people will have like an eye patch. That could be maybe a clue that somebody has had a traumatic brain injury. Um, people might have a change or a loss of hearing. Um, your speech could be slowed or slurred. Um, and there are some speech you know, disorders that, that can happen after a brain injury. Um, this one, just like any of these can be really challenging, um, can be difficult because people think you are drunk sometimes if you have slowed or slurred speech. And I know that there's at least one or two stories I've heard where somebody who's had a TBI that then has difficulty speaking has had an encounter with the police where the police think they're drunk, um, right? So that can escalate things. Um, and I know one person that I work with has really slowed and slurred speech. And it, um, every time he tries to make a call to Comcast or to you know, Pepco or something, he isn't taken seriously. And people think he's, he's been drinking. Um, and so I, I think one thing that I've learned working in, in this role is to really not assume anything about um, how somebody's presenting or looking or talking. Um, right? We don't know why people are maybe sounding the way that they are. Um, something that can happen, you see this more in strokes, is changes with spasticity. Um, where, so you might see this where people um, aren't able to release their muscles. Um, and then tremors. <coughs> mm -hmm, right, where that's sort of frozen. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Um, seizures are certainly common. A lot of people who have had a traumatic brain injury will be put on anti-seizure medication. So perhaps as you're looking at somebody's um, medication list, if you see that um, they're on an anti-seizure medication, it could be a clue to ask if they've had a TBI. You might see changes with motor skills and balance. Um, fatigue and weakness are very common. Um, and then a change or a taste and smell. So those are some physical changes. There are definitely cognitive changes, um, which is what I was hearing from some of you. So memory is, is a huge um, problem, potentially. Um, a lot of people struggle with short-term memory loss. Um, and I will say that some of these cognitive changes can look maybe like a developmental disability. It's taking people a little bit longer to process things, um, or like somebody's being difficult. Um, so I would just think about that if you're seeing somebody that is acting difficult. Um, is there something else going on? Um, it can also affect somebody's ability to pay attention, their concentration. Um, and we'll talk about this, but these are really big issues if somebody's in treatment for a substance use disorder. If they're having trouble getting to their appointments, um, if they're having trouble staying engaged in group, that can often lead to um, early dismissal, or early dismissal, early discharge, um, and is often framed as somebody being noncompliant. Um, people might struggle with a lack of awareness. This is a really common issue with brain injury, is people don't know what's changed. 
um, for them after their injury. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, again, with language, some people have trouble expressing um, what they're trying to say. So something's like on the tip of your tongue, but you can't quite get it out. Or I might have receptive aphasia where I'm hearing what you're saying, but it doesn't really make sense. And that can really create an issue if you're trying to have a conversation with somebody, um, if they're you know, not understanding what you're saying. And then behavioral changes, um, these can look like a mental illness. So a lot of people deal with depression and anxiety. Um, and I don't think I have a slide on this, but a lot of these changes can be for a couple of reasons. So it could be because there's been a change to your brain and that deals with your emotions. Um, it could be because, um, especially with more moderate or severe injuries, that might be because there's a loss in job or a change in roles. Maybe somebody's caring for you now, and that can create a whole lot of, of difficulty with your mental health. Um, and then also it could just be something that's very unrelated to the TBI. If I had depression before a traumatic brain injury, I'll probably deal with it afterwards. Um, some people deal with mood swings and difficulty controlling emotions. Um, that sort of goes to that impulsivity you had mentioned. Um, people struggle with getting started, um, with initiating, and then um, they might have trouble in relationships. So I'll talk a little bit about mental health and traumatic brain injury, and then we'll talk about mental health and substance use, or and TBI and substance use. Um, and I apologize for how uh, full these slides are. But about one in five individuals um, experience mental health symptoms up to six months after a mild TBI. Um, depression and anxiety are frequent following TBI. Um, and something that I think is, is good to know is that the risk for death by suicide is three times greater for people with traumatic brain injury. So this is really affecting people. They're dealing with, with depression and anxiety. Um, if somebody is dealing with then a psychiatric disorder or a substance use disorder and a traumatic brain injury, that's only, it's complex, absolutely. And that's only gonna increase um, the risk of death by suicide. Um, People with traumatic brain injury do have higher rates of anxiety disorders. Um, that's often generalized anxiety disorder and PTSD. Um, there's a little bit higher rates of PTSD for people with traumatic brain injuries. Um, some studies have found that people um, with TBI have higher rates of personality disorders. And then one thing that I think is, is surprising is that a childhood traumatic brain injury doubles the likelihood of a psychiatric disorder um, by early adulthood. So child, children with brain injuries are growing into adults that then have mental health you know, problems or concerns. I'm sorry? Yeah, to have more. Yeah. Right, so um, as you're working with people, um, the cause could be, you know, the cause of a, a disorder could be an early childhood traumatic brain injury, potentially. Um, so I'll talk about a substance use disorder as well. Um, one thing that I think is important, um, as, as the speaker before me was talking about with stigma, um, is to use appropriate language so we don't call people addicts. Um, we say it's somebody who maybe deals with an addiction or they have a substance use disorder. Um, people with substance use disorders are treated really, really badly um, by professionals and by our society. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But there are criteria for, you know, to meet a substance use disorder. Um, exactly, and that's, that's a good point. Treatment for substance use disorder is short. Um, and if you know anything about the stages of change, it takes time to change. Um, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So there are different criteria. I think there's 11 in the DSM-5. Um, nine out of those 11 are about not responding to negative consequences or stimuli. So some criteria, this doesn't include all of them, are craving right for the substance, wanting to cut down um, or stop, but not being able to or struggling with that. Um, somebody might be taking the substance in larger amounts or for longer than you're supposed to. So you maybe start with a medication after your tonsillectomy and then you keep using it. For example, mm -hmm. yeah, and we can talk about that more afterwards. Um, so then, another piece of a substance use disorder is um, neglecting other parts of your life. Um, 
I know at a lot of the, the mental health intakes I have been a part of, um, people ask, okay, are you using too much? Check, you know, yes or no. Are you, are you feeling guilty about how much you're using? Is it starting to have other consequences in your life? Are you struggling to um, maintain relationships or struggling to um, get to work on time, things like that? Um, and then, as I said, if you're using, you know, then it might continue to cause problems in relationships. Um, and you might use, even if it's putting you in danger. So substance use and traumatic brain injury are um, very intertwined as well. So substance use disorder is a risk factor for sustaining a traumatic brain injury. About 50% of people who are seen in the ER, um, or who are hospitalized, I'm sorry, um, as a result, or with a TBI have alcohol on board at that time. Um, so that's a lot of people who are dealing with, with alcohol use then sustaining injuries. Um, and then having a traumatic brain injury does make it a little more likely that you'll have um, issues with substance use. It is linked to worse outcomes after a traumatic brain injury. Um, it does um, make recovery more difficult for people. Um, and then substance use or abuse is linked to recurrent TBI. Um, so I wanted, this probably isn't anything terribly new to you, but I wanted to talk about substance use and mental illness. Um, there's a huge overlap there as well. So about 50% of people who experience mental illness in their lifetime will also struggle with a substance use disorder, vice versa. Um, one way of thinking about this too is that mental illness and substance use disorder can also be considered like brain diseases. Um, that is one way of thinking about addiction. That is not, that's just one model, that, that it is a disease and a chronic disease. Um, mental illnesses might lead people to self-medicate or to, to deal with the symptoms of their, their mental health. Um, and one thing that is important to note for people with brain injuries, for people with, that use substances, and then people with mental health is there is um, often a history of trauma that goes into this as well. Um, so I wanted to talk about just some considerations, so things that you're probably familiar with, things that make it hard to treat people with all these co-occurring disorders. Um, one thing that I know that we have seen is that people in the mental health field or in the substance use uh, or treatment field don't always know about brain injury. Um, so that's something that we're always working to, to share information for. Um, because what often happens is that people with a history of a traumatic brain injury will be struggling to engage in treatment or therapies um, or traditional therapies. They might not, like I said, show up to appointments on time. They're disorganized. Um, and that in the current system that we live in means, I don't know, we have narratives we say about people that don't show up on time or that don't attend regularly, right? We think they're unmotivated or they're not really interested in change. And that's not always the case. Um, I think one thing also is that treatments or different doctors aren't always communicating, right? I don't know that my neurologist is talking to my therapist, is talking to the person that's working with me for my substance use disorder. Um, and that can create a lot of issues. They may have what, I'm sorry? Medical records in multiple hospitals. Yeah, medical records in multiple hospitals. Oh, hospitals. sure, yeah, there's just, in general, a treatment is very specific to the issue that you're dealing with. There's not a lot of integrated treatment happening, um, which is, the ideal way to treat these things is integrated treatment. Um, and it's not, not possible often. Um, one thing that I believe I mentioned is that sometimes the most obvious or the most um, clearly presenting issue is treated, but then other things aren't addressed. So if I go to the hospital um, with suicidal you know, ideation, we will be dealing with that, but somebody might not ask me if I've had a traumatic brain injury or if I'm dealing with a substance use disorder. Or they give you a referral. Uh-huh, sure, yeah, or you get a referral, right. Yeah, I think also another thing um, is just unaddressed stigma in various settings. Um, so I might not feel comfortable telling my physical therapist that I um, am dealing with a substance use disorder. Um, or I might not wanna talk to my therapist about now this disability that I have, this traumatic brain injury. Um, an integrated intervention is the, the ideal model, but it's often not possible. So I know for traumatic brain injury, there's been a lot of great 
um, like model programs where people are being treated for their traumatic brain injury and their substance use disorder. Um, but I haven't, and it just could be my ignorance, I haven't seen one where it's for traumatic brain injury, for my mental health, and my substance use disorder. Yeah, and it, it could be out there. <laughs> Um, right, and substance use will often incorporate mental health um, strategies, but there's a lack of, of treatment available for all the different things people are dealing with. Um, so how do you support somebody with these conditions? Um, and this is, some of these are more geared towards professionals, and then some of these are more geared towards people that um, have loved ones with these conditions. Um, but I think listening is key. First and foremost, you have to ask somebody what, um, what they want, what they need. Uh, this is especially true if somebody has a disability or if somebody uses drugs. Um, oftentimes, if somebody has a disability, people assume they know what's best for them um, and are not listening to what they want. Uh, same at work, the same thing happens if people use drugs. They assume that they don't know um, what might work for them or what might be best, but people are experts in their own lives um, regardless. I think it's important then too to ask questions. Um, what helps you manage your, your depression? What would help you stay engaged in, um, in therapy? You know, are there strategies we can put in place so that you remember the session? That's something that happens with somebody with short-term memory loss is I might have a really good session with somebody, um, counseling session, and then you leave and you go back two weeks later and they don't remember something you've talked about. So can I write down notes for you? Is that okay? Um, I think respecting boundaries, of course, is important. Um, if it's appropriate, you can encourage self-advocacy so that what that could look like is having somebody have like um, maybe a card that they give all their doctors that says, hey, I have a traumatic brain injury. Um, can we talk about what that looks like for me? Um, just have, starting the conversation about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that could be, could be helpful. Um, but oftentimes, people have to, to educate their providers about um, the things that they're dealing with. Um, you can support somebody in keeping appointments. So you can help them remember, um, particularly if they're dealing with short-term memory loss, um, or just encourage them to keep going if that's been helpful. Um, one thing I would say, particularly with substance use disorder, is to learn about harm reduction. And I have a video to show you. Does it, do you mind raising your hands if, is harm reduction a familiar concept? All right, a couple of you, okay. Um, so I, that's not the point of my talk, but it's something I think is important to, to bring up. So I'll show you a video. I'm sorry? Potentially, yeah, this is, so this video is geared more towards um, drug use, but we can talk about how it looks in other settings, certainly. Oh, of course, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. Look, you're smart, you're cool, and you don't want to die, so you do things to reduce the harm of the risks you take. That's called harm reduction. Oh. It's all around us. Harm reduction is common sense. It stops people from being injured and dying from things that are preventable. It saves lives. It saves money. It's smart. Here's a fact. Last year, 47,000 people died of drug overdoses in the United States. Because you're smart, you know these deaths are preventable. But here's something you may not know. Some kinds of prevention don't work. Just say no. Who taught you how to do this? In question? It's time to stop the drugs. We've tried all these things, and still the number of people dying of overdoses continues to rise. But remember, you're smart. And because you're smart, you want to stop these preventable deaths. Do you know what is clinically proven to work? Harm reduction. You remember that, right? Harm reduction works for people who use drugs. It knows that people aren't perfect, but 
They deserve every opportunity to be as safe as possible. It encourages people to get educated and connected with healthcare. Harm reduction provides access to naloxone, the drug that reverses overdoses. It provides people with sterile supplies to prevent the spread of HIV and viral hepatitis. And when harm reduction is implemented in its most effective form, it gives people who use drugs access to supervised injection facilities in order to provide life-saving interventions in the event of an overdose. In 102 supervised injection facilities worldwide, there's yet to be a single fatal overdose. With more than 47,000 overdose deaths each year, what are you waiting for? Support safer, healthier communities by supporting supervised injection facilities in your city today. Learn more at www.harmreductionactioncenter.org. Mm hmm yeah. Mm -hmm. Canada has overdose prevention sites. Yep. Yeah, so I like to just introduce the, the concept of harm reduction um, every time I talk. Hopefully, um, people start to learn a little bit more about it. But the idea is that um, people who use drugs deserve to be safe and alive. And so if somebody's not quite ready to engage in treatment, um, how can we support them maybe in getting there? Um, and how can we support them even if they're not ready to change at all. So um, can we talk about how to, um, could be a whole host of different things, but having access to naloxone. So if you're somebody that uses drugs, having that medication that can prevent an overdose, right? We want you to stay alive. Um, we can talk about that more if you're interested, um, but that's something that I think is important um, to encourage with people. There is some more information coming, about, coming out about harm reduction and mental health. So I think the point that you made about maybe hiding knives um, is a really good point. I don't know all the different strategies people use um, for that. I know there is one harm reduction guide I'll share with you. It's very specific, but there's a harm reduction guide to coming off of psychiatric drugs. Um, do you guys know, or do you all know the Icarus Project? Have you heard about them? Um, it's a phenomenal, it's a pretty radical um, organization, so there's that caveat, but they um, do a lot of advocacy around mental health um, and madness, as they call it, and sort of reclaiming madness. Um, and so this could be a resource that you share with somebody if they're wanting to come off psych medications. How do you do that safely and in a way that, um, that will keep you, you know, safe and healthy? So I'm happy to share that later. Um, so other ways you can support people are to be patient. Change doesn't happen overnight. Patience is, has been something, I'm a pretty patient person, but I have, would say I have been tested a lot as I work with people with brain injuries. Um, no disrespect, it's just that um, brain injuries might mean that some people talk a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, or some people, it takes some time to get their thoughts into, into words. So I, you know, I'm sitting there and we're, we're working through that together, so it's, I would encourage you to be patient with somebody. Um, or if somebody has short-term memory loss, right, that can be frustrating because you have to remind them of things a lot, um, but there's a change in their brain, right? We have to support them still through that. Lability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, lability is something that we see too. And there's something called pseudo-bulbar effect where people do cry um, inappropriately, um, pardon me, or laugh inappropriately, correct, yeah. Um, and so that's something that would require patience too, right? You don't always know why somebody is acting well, that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons why people do the things they do. Um, one thing I always encourage people to do is learn about any disorder that isn't your specialty. Um, something that I hear a lot for people looking for mental health services that have a traumatic brain injury is they call a therapist and they say, well, I don't specialize in traumatic brain injury, so you need to go see somebody else. Um, and I, I get the impulse to want to know everything about something before you work with somebody. Um, but there are some simple accommodations that you can make for somebody with a brain injury that don't require you to be a specialist. Um, would you deny somebody care if they had another you know, medical condition? Um, so I would learn about it. This, sorry, um, this is a really helpful place to start, the accommodating the symptoms of TBI. Just some pretty practical strategies that you can use with somebody. Um, I'm not sure. It's probably easier to read for, for people. Um, it makes it more accessible for people that, that have vis difficulty with vision. Um, so there's, well, 
I'll let you look at that, and then there's a module online that you can, can go through as well. Um, if, there, if you certainly, if you just can't treat somebody um, with the things that they have going on, um, if their substance use disorder is so severe it's, it's interfering with you being able to talk with them, um, then, then absolutely make appropriate referrals, right? But see if there are ways you can engage with somebody. Um, a lot of these come from SAMHSA's um, suggestions, so I'll share those at the end, like their toolkits. But um, you can always encourage general coping skills. That's gonna help with any of these issues, right? I think when you see somebody that has a substance use disorder, traumatic brain injury, depression, bipolar, that's scary sometimes. That's a lot of things you're trying to manage with somebody. Um, but there are still lots of things that you can do. Um, so encouraging self-care, encouraging just general coping skills and drawing on somebody's strengths as well. Um, <coughs> can learn about motivational interviewing. Does anybody use that right now? Yeah, motivational interviewing, exactly. So that's a, a tool that I think is helpful in, in, have, in your toolbox. That helps with, um, right, with supporting change. So how can we help people change, hopefully to use drugs less over time, for example. Um, but it also can be helpful for self-awareness. So a lot of the people I work with really struggle um, with a lack of awareness. They don't know that there's anything different about um, their cognitive abilities after their injury. So that's something that I try to use too to encourage you know, self-reflection and self-awareness. Um, and then you can learn about harm reduction too. Of course, I already plugged that. Um, I don't have any like earth-shattering new ideas about how to support somebody, um, but I wanted to talk about just some of the basics that we, we can do that aren't expensive, things that you can incorporate into your practice. Um, and I think education and right empathy is, is key to a lot of these things. Um, so then I, I find this helpful too because we have to listen to the people that are affected by these things. Um, so this is a, an article from Brainline that just asked people, they were like, what's the most helpful thing that somebody has done for you since your brain injury? Um, and people responded with a whole host of things. So people said that somebody exercising patience was the most helpful, um, loving the new me. Someone said, don't try to fix me. That's the most helpful thing you can do. Just let me be me. Um, somebody said, you know, you took care of my two-year-old so I could have some quiet time. Remind me of the things I forgot. Show me a kindly a new way of doing the same task more efficiently. Um, so I, that sort of goes back to asking people what helps them, asking people what, what needs they have. Um, with co-occurring disorders, some things that are general recommendations are, and I wouldn't expect this of anyone, but sometimes, you know, if um, friends or family members are concerned about somebody who's using drugs, um, it becomes a really heated debate, and it becomes about what you need to change, right? Um, and while that is rooted in concern and rooted in a good, um, you know, coming from a good place, it can create more issues. So starting a dialogue with somebody that you're worried about, um, asking about, or learning more about the condition on your own. Um, if somebody wants to tell you, right, about their brain injury and what's helpful for them or about what works um, as they're getting treatment for a substance use disorder, great. But um, I wouldn't, a lot of times people it, that are marginalized have to do a lot of work to, to tr explain things to you. So I would always encourage you to try to learn as much as you can um, rather than putting that like labor on somebody. Um, ask what you can do to support somebody. I think taking care of yourself, of course, is important, um, especially if you're a loved one or a family member or you're dealing with all of these things yourself. Um, you have to, perfect, um, you have to take care of yourself and to, to have good boundaries too, right? Caring about people doesn't mean you ignore your own boundaries. Um, and then you don't wanna try to fix or save somebody. Um, that doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> Um, so these are some resources I thought I would share with you and where I pulled some of the recommendations from. Um, like I said, there's not a perfect, beautiful, easy answer on how to deal, um, not deal with, but support or treat people that have a lot of conditions going on, but there's some basic, thing, basic things we can do. Um, so there's a substance abuse treatment for persons with co-occurring co disor disorders, um, a tip, like, PDF, I think that's like 50 pages, so there's a lot of good recommendations. Um, there's suggestions and evidence for 
for integrated treatment for co-occurring disorders. Um, I'm sorry? Program, they, that's an acute rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's a little bit different than integrated treatment. Um, there's also, for people that work in substance use, um, treatment, how to treat and work with clients with traumatic brain injury. Um, and then the handout, the accommodating the symptoms of traumatic brain injury is available online as well. Um, and that is it for me. I'm happy to talk through any questions you have or if you want to see me after, if there's somebody specific that you're working with. Yep, my card is up here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Are there any questions or comments or thoughts? I don't know. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of evidence coming out about meditation and yoga to help with, with your brain in general. Thank you all. I appreciate your attention. He, he was adopted, so he's got a lot of... Uh, yeah, history. Medical history, and he's like, oh, this is all about the brain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. 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 They're resilient, yeah.